Good evening, it's April 11th, 2014. My name is Matthew Ogden, and I will be hosting this evening's broadcast of our weekly Friday webcast on LaRouchePack.com. Uh, we're joined, as we always are, by Mr. Lyndon LaRouche tonight, and also Cody Jones, who will be asking, along with myself, a series of questions. Now, right before I begin, I want to uh, just show our viewers that this week, LaRouche Pack bought a second full-page ad in the Washington Times. This is the April 9th edition. Uh, the front page says, War of Extinction, with Barack Obama's face. And then the back page is a full page illustration of a mushroom cloud with Barack Obama's face inside. Again, saying extinction war along the top. This is reminiscent of a uh, advertisement that Mr. LaRouche commissioned in 1976 of Jimmy Carter's face in a mushroom cloud during the 1976 presidential campaign. Now, our first question today is a very short question. It comes from an institutional source. Um, and the question reads as follows. Mr. LaRouche, we have taken note of your recent writings on the Greek mythological conflict between Prometheus and Zeus. How would Prometheus approach the Obama administration? Actually, he would destroy <laughs> the enemy. <laughs> and this, the time has come to pretty much to do that. We're at a point where the possibility of the existence of the human species depends on some considerations. In fact, what's happening is that contrary to what is people are saying in the news reports, uh, things like that, other scandal sheets and trivial sources, is the fact is we're headed toward a thermonuclear war. The discussion that this is a bit of warfare which is going on between uh, Russia and other nations and Europe is a lot of nonsense. There's no truth to it. The issue here is there's no reason for, for this in, in any ordinary sense. The point is that the British system, the British imperial system, is coming down. And the collapse of the British imperial system, which is also affects Wall Street very strongly, that these institutions are coming down because what they've gone through a process which is called bail up, out and then bail in. Now what happens with bail out, it started some time ago when they began to pump out a lot of worthless assets into Wall Street and into the comparable institutions in Europe. And it reached a certain point where it came toward a bursting point where the rate of growth of this worth, worthless money, worthless credit, was about to pop. And that led them to the conclusion that they had to go into a bail-in process. Now, a bail-in process is an act of, of sort of cannibalism. You eat all your entrails, uh, and when you get down to the end, entrail, or the, everything goes pop, and they all disappear. So this point is in process now. The entire transatlantic system is on the verge of a basis, including Wall Street in particular, that Wall Street is about to totally go into a collapse, a complete implosion. You know, this, I've described this before, saying, imagine you're on the 70th floor of a skyscraper, and imagine the cable broke at that point. Now, just imagine what the effect would be by the time you reach the first floor. And that's what the problem is. So therefore, the, but the, look, look at the, how this thing works. The issue is, who is going to pay the debts of this worthless, for this worthless money? And the point answer is that if we go to a war and the United States and Britain win the war, then nobody owes anything for the worthless debts. Hmm. However, if the, uh, if the collapse come, becomes before the war, then Wall Street and London 
go out of existence. So the issue is here is that which end of the bailout, bail-in process is going to hit first? Is the 70, we're going to hit this first floor of a 74, 70 uh, story structure? Or is the system going to collapse before it hits the basement? And therefore, that's the rush on the part of the British Empire and of Wall Street. Now, there are some idiots out there who will say this is an issue between Russia and some other parties, including the United States. That is absolute bunk. That is not the issue. The issue is the bail-in issue. The point is, we take the Queen's policy. She's been very clear about it especially from the period of the Copenhagen conference, where she tried to pull something off there and it got turned down by various nations. And therefore, she now is faced with the, question, with the fact that this, her system is now going to collapse, the Wall Street system included. And therefore, the rush is to have a war, a global thermonuclear war, before the first floor hits the ground. And that's what the issue is. And so therefore, if that's why they're pushing, that's why Obama's pushing, that's why the British are pushing. They're pushing for an immediate war in order to not to be wiped out. Because the entire British Empire would go through a chain reaction disintegration if that sequence were to occur. Now, this is uh, the problem here is that most people, including so-called economists, are absolute idiots. That is, what they think they understand is, is something which is actually silly and stupid. You cannot, first of all, as I if I'm dealing with this uh, in something I've written recently, which is on this subject, uh, the, the actual issue here, uh, that if I were to simply say, let's shut down Wall Street, we could shut it down. There's no value there. There's no substantive value. Wall Street should be simply wiped out cancel all its obligations. It has, no, it has no, no assets. There's nothing there. It's a balloon which has been pricked. And therefore, the question is, what are we going to do about this? I don't propose that we just, just debate this thing. I propose that we take action. And the action is simply, first of all, the immediate installation of the Glass-Steagall law. Number one. That will solve the problem, because that leaves Wall Street and London barefaced and bare this and bare other things. That's our, the essential solution. Now we have to have a recovery. And I've gone through this in this, you know, build the real American party. First of all, after having decided we're going to go with Glass-Steagall recovery, that does not solve the problem, but it's the foundation on which the solution can be brought forward. The next thing we have to do, having canceled all the obligations of Wall Street, say they're worthless anyway, the bail-in process, the bailout bail-in process demonstrates there is no intrinsic value in Wall Street, none. You can just wipe it off the books, it's completely fraud, there's, there's nothing coming to it. Wall Street has nothing coming to it. Now, there's, the assumption is that Wall Street has a lot of money, monetary assets, monetary obligations, et cetera, et cetera. But I say that's nonsense. And I speak on the authority of the U.S. Constitution, as defined by Alexander Hamilton. And Alexander Hamilton's four terms defining the, the uh, policy of the United States as the policy of the U.S. system under law. No one gets bailed out out of a Wall Street debt. 
You got the debt? Wear it if you can. Hmm? Because what we're going to we do, I, I simply cancel, recognize in one way or the other, cancel all Wall Street obligations. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to shut down the banking system. That would be a myth. The problem is, see, most people are so stupid when it comes to economy. And most, most economists and monetarists generally are so stupid. They don't know the obvious. And as long as they can kid the, the average citizen into believing that this, what they have assets there that are worth something, is a delusion. It right at any moment, anybody walks in, it's an incarnation of Alexander Hamilton, and he'll say, you guys are bankrupt. Get out of here. You're gone. You have no assets. Because the U.S. system does not provide for money assets. Our system is the same system was used in the, by the, the, uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the same principle. The point is, what, money has no intrinsic value. That's the point. What, what has value is production of good things, useful things, things that increase the productive powers of labor, so forth. And we operate on a credit system exactly the way Alexander Hamilton, who designed this system, this part of the constitutional system was designed by him. What happened was, however, they assassinated him. Now, the job was done by a British agent who assassinated Alexander Hamilton. But the whole Mat Manhattan Island area was loaded with Dutch bankers and British bankers. And the United States was looted, especially in the New York City and Boston area. They were looted by these guys. And they got by with it. So the time has come. We only have to recognize, and anyone who wants to go through it, I've got the document here before me, a document I've written. It's a document which very few people in the United States have the competence to know because they never found out what the truth is. Money has no intrinsic value under our system. Our system is a credit system not a monetarist system. And what, what, so there, they, these, these are the issues. So we're now at the point where if we put, put do, first of all, Glass-Steagall. Now that's not the solution. That is an essential part of the solution. Next thing we have to do is something else. We have to provide a, a, a national credit system. And we use we, the national credit system is a means by which the United States simply produces employment and productive employment and provides, and provides for the needs of people who have no means to exist, and like children and so forth. But we don't believe in a money system. We don't believe that money has any intrinsic value. And if you study what, what Alexander Hamilton did in his four pieces of legislation on the system, you will understand everything. You may ask a lot of questions to find, to find what all this means, but I can say there are four, there are four specific rec records delivered by Alexander Hamilton within his term in, in office, which set forth the system of the United States. Now, the first thing is we create credit. So therefore, we, we create credit for employment, for investments in, in useful things. And we can do that. But then we have to go beyond that. We have to go into certain thi large things which are not simply part of the productive process, as, as he defines it. We have to go outside that, that range. And we can do that too. So we have to have a system, first of all, which is a credit system, which puts, makes available the ability to employ, employ people for production automatically, immediately. And we try to get as much employment of the right kind as possible. We try to raise the productive powers of labor, increase the productive powers of labor, and things of that sort. But then we do other things. 
because this part is part of the productive process. The next thing we have to do is we have to also at the same time, we have to provide for new, new requirements. For example, right now, the United States is in terrible condition. Most of the world is in terrible condition. And uh, we, don't, we do not have the, uh, well, let's put it this way. The, United, the western part of the United States, west of the Mississippi River, is now going into a very long-term period of drought, deep and prolonged drought, from the Mississippi River all the way across the Pacific, so to speak. So there's no future for anybody living west of the Mississippi, except people like no fracking good people who are doing all this fracking operation. So therefore, how can we, if we don't have the water, we don't have enough water to maintain the states west of the Mississippi? The sun has gone into a silent period, a quiet period, and there will never be enough, if we leave it alone, there will never be enough to revive the economy of the United States west of the Mississippi. That's what stands right now. So therefore, we're going to have to do something about that. What are we going to do? We're going to actually cancel the green policy. We're going to go into high technology, energy flux density, high energy flux density things, like, you know, power. And we're going to actually build fusion, thermonuclear fusion programs. And these thermonuclear fusion programs will give us the ability to, to actually produce the moisture we require, but it requires high technology de development. On that basis, then, we will create a new category of large industries, which are high technology industries, very high technology, thermonuclear fusion technologies. Now, today we have a problem. Mo we have very few people who are competent at production. Most of our people who are engaged in production are absolutely technologically incompetent because they have no, no understanding of what this kind of thing means, going to this kind of high technology. And therefore, we have to create a new category which includes NOAPA. The entire western part of the United States and Canada and northern Mexico has to come under a new water project process, which is the NOAPA system. In other words, an amplified NOAPA system. We will drive that NOAPA system by the aid of a high technology driver, a thermonuclear fusion driver technology, which will be the, the high level of the in, input and output that we get for this process. On that basis, we have it made because we're going to be driving people to high technology. We have to cancel all low technology methods. In other words, wherever we, we have something to produce, we try to produce a high technology method of production. We do not allow green policies to be used in the United States. It's silly to try to create a green policy in a desert area. And in fact, it's a fraud to try to do that. So therefore, there are methods, there's actions we have to take, and I've detailed this in this report, identified what the scientific principles are and what has to be done. We have now the prospect, if we got enough people with, with enough brains and enough guts to do it, we have the ability to immediately organize a massive recovery program. That doesn't mean everything is going to get juicy all at once. It means we're going to start on the way up and every day is going to be a better day than the day be before. It's going to be slow at first, but we have to go to very high technology. One of the problems is this. What do we think you have out there? We have a number of, of scientists. They're retiring. They are being retired. They're being shouted off at some place. They're not doing science anymore. Why? Well, that goes back to uh, 1900. In the year 1900, an idiot, an, a mathematician, said he was a scientist. 
and he could eliminate all science, all physical science, in, by mathematics. Then a greater, a more criminal idiot came in. Uh, and he really went at it and went, get, launched the whole green policy business, demanding the reduction of, reduction, reductionist methods of production. Uh, and this evil by Bertrand Russell, the most evil man of the 20th century, his, the person who, did, who is most responsible for destroying the United States, Europe, and other places. And therefore, we are going to have to go to these, these methods which I've indicated, and which are in some lengths, it's 33 pages in TypeScript, so you have to go through the thing. <coughs> but the, in short, the answer is there. I know what we can do. Leading scientists know the technologies. We've got to do it. We've got to enter into cooperation on a global basis with China, with other major nations, with Europe and so forth. We have to start these kinds of high technology programs. They will solve this problem. But it's going to take some time to get these programs cranked up. We have to eliminate the green policy. We have to eliminate the kind of technology pro approaches which are being used now. We have a bunch of people out there who are using computers, and they think computers can produce scientific results. They're crap artists. They don't know what they're talking about. We, are, we are take our greatest scientists who are still around, we put them on the shelf. We don't give them any work to do. We don't allow them to do any work. They may sneak some work in because they want to do it, but they're never given backing. And what we need is we need to reactivate the scientific potential that the United States used to have that other parts of the world still have and cherish. We're going to have to create a science driver program in the green policy because the green policy would be the death of humanity. It would be the mass murder of humanity. We have to go back to a high technology program which is based on engineering, not, not, not arithmetic. You cannot calculate your way into a solution in this matter. You have to apply a physical scientific approach to it. And that's what the problem is. We're now at a point, unless we change our ways, we're on the verge of either a thermonuclear war, because that's where we're headed. Right now, if the United States resists the Obama policy, we, have really, got, we really have a, a mess on our hands. If he tries to do that. If he gets by with it, you're going to have a thermonuclear war. And a thermonuclear war means that very few people will survive it. So the time has come, you have no more choice. If you're green, start running. I'm telling you, run. Because either the circumstances will get you out of your own stupidity, or you'll be running against the people who hate your guts. <laughs> Well, let me, let me pick up on what you just said about Obama. Um, maybe this is going from ancient Greece to ancient Rome. Um, today, as some people may recognize, marks a special occasion. Today is April 11th, 2014, and it's the five-year anniversary of Mr. LaRouche's April 11th, 2009 webcast in which he first identified Obama as a Nero personality. Uh, this webcast occurred immediately after Obama had made his first trip to London to meet Her Majesty the Queen. And observing his behavior there, you said the following. This is in 2009. The situation we face in the United States and worldwide is comparable in many respects to Rome, under the dictatorship of Emperor Nero. The character of the president under these conditions is of that form. He has a Nero problem. He's a contemporary Nero. Famous kind of problem. And if you leave him in there, you're going to find out the kind of effect that he's going to play. 
he's going to play the role of a Nero. His self-adulation, his manic, euphoric self-adulation, that's the mentality of the worst kind of dictator. Don't let him get in a position where he has that kind of power. That was five years ago today. Now, at the time you said this, Lynn, leading people in the Democratic Party reacted hysterically, accusing you of being over the top. However, five years later, your warnings have been more than vindicated, and their denials of reality have brought the world to the brink of thermonuclear war. Now, last week, Obama's Nero personality was put on clear display when he showed up in Rome after having just participated in nuclear war games at The Hague, and he was given a tour of the Colosseum. Um, and the reports are that he relished every minute of this hour-long tour, clearly channeling Nero as he eagerly listened to the story that the tour guide was telling him of how the gladiator Commodus beheaded an ostrich with his sword and carried the bleeding head over to where the Roman Senate was seated, as if to say, you're next. And it was reported that, upon hearing this story, Obama opened his eyes widely and smiling repeated it to his staff as if to say, you should memorize this. Perhaps he was envisioning Dianne Feinstein. And then when he was shown the view from the top level, the third tier of the Colosseum, he commented to the tour guide, he said, these must be the best seats in the house. From here you can see everything, but you're at a safe distance from all that blood and gore. Uh, perhaps a little bit like a drone killing. So he was apparently also very curious to know if there was a death that occurred during every game, uh, which is not surprising considering Obama's weekly kill list meetings every Tuesday where he gets to be the Emperor Nero and give the thumbs up or the thumbs down. And people should remember when Nero felt that his power was slipping away, he reportedly ordered the burning of Rome and afterwards blamed the Christians as a pretext for ordering mass crucifixions, sort of a pre-echo of Hitler's Reichstag fire. Uh, and now we have a Nero in the White House. Is this the type of personality that we really want to have controlling the U.S. nuclear arsenal? And I would recall to people, again, the image that we had on the back of the Washington Times of Obama's face in a mushroom cloud. So the question is, Lynn, five years later, what would you say to those inside the Democratic Party who loudly protested at the time that your diagnosis of Obama as a Nero was over the top? Well, it certainly wasn't. I think if you take the scorecards for what happened to people in their jobs, their conditions of life and so forth, there's no doubt this man is evil. This man is purely evil. He could not do what he was doing. I mean, like what he did and the cuts he did, the things he did in the beginning of this year. This man is a mass murderer, and he has no business being in the presidency of the United States. But then people are playing games. You have, and you just, and how idiot can people be? You have Republicans now, and they're saying, hold off on Glass-Steagall. Don't pass Glass-Steagall. Why? Because you class Glass-Steagall, we won't be able to get, get our game when it comes our turn for our getting the, the presidency of the United States. And that's what's, hap that's what's happening with these guys. That's Wall Street. That's the Republican Party. Now, there may be Republicans among them who don't agree with this crap, but you, the, the majority of the Republicans are actually based on themselves on pure evil. Now, what's their base it on? Ah, this is what gets interesting. It's Wall Street money. 
They don't have real money. They have Wall Street bail out money. In other words, they printed money which had no value. Huh? And every time they turn around, they would say, well, we have to qualitative, e quantitative easing, quantitative easing, quantitative easing. What was that? It was nothing but voluntary inflation. And the Wall Street gangsters and the British gangsters and others in Europe were making money by printing it. They didn't even print it. They mentioned it. <laughs> and they called it theirs. Then you take the rate at which of inflation, which is going on in Wall Street, look at the trillions of dollars levels of increase of worthless money. Absolutely worthless. And now what happens is even some of my friends in the Democratic Party say, but you've got to, you've got to come to a rec reconciliation with Wall Street. I say, no, we don't owe them anything. They stole it. How'd they steal it? They got some crooked officials in the, in the government, in the Treasury Department, elsewhere. These officials created fraudulent money. They created a crime against the American people. This money is worthless. It always was worthless. There's no value to it at all. All we have to do is put to Glass-Steagall first. Next, you put to Glass-Steagall. That does not solve the problem. It clears the deck for solving the problem. And Glass-Steagall with no change. Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Glass-Steagall law with no changes whatsoever in the law itself. That means you wipe these guys out in much the same way, but with greater quality today, of what was done to Wall Street by President Franklin Roosevelt, which saved the United States, by the way, and saved us from some kind of a Hitler-like dictatorship, which was on the edge of coming around. Wall Street was prepared to go and were prevented, and they were prevented from acting by force, by a coup d'etat, like Hitler's coup d'etat, to take power over the United States. And we had a general, a Marine general, who intervened and wiped that thing out. That saved our nation from a Hitler-like dictatorship. And remember, the Hitler-like dictatorships were made by Brit the British Empire. And then Churchill discovered, oh my, this ain't going to work out. He said, because they're going to kill us. We thought Hitler was our friend. <laughs> and the man with the umbrella? The man with, with the bumper shoot? <laughs> and then the next thing, Churchill said, you guys are too crazy altogether. I'm firing you. <laughs> And so he got on the phone and he called up Franklin Roosevelt. And <laughs> Franklin Roosevelt said, yes. <laughs> I didn't mean, defect yours. He said, I need help. Well, Franklin Roosevelt, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can you help me? Well, I tell you, speaking like Franklin Roosevelt, we have some destroyers, which are not our best quality destroyers, but since you have a, a, a German submarine fleet out there trying to sink your, your merchant marine, I think that perhaps we can find a way in which to make things a little bit easier for you. And Roosevelt did what he said he was going to do. Roosevelt took the occasion to organize the greatest, actually since, since Abraham Lincoln, the greatest mobilization of the United States for economic recovery from a disaster. One was Abraham Lincoln. He had absolutely no money available. And this is a lesson from, guess who? Alexander Hamilton. No money was available to speak of. The banks were all, the banks in the United States that were banking were all crooks. 
And Franklin Roosevelt went to the Treasury Department and said, well, I'm the President of the United States. I'm setting up greenbacks. And greenbacks are a credit system warranted by the uh, U.S. government. What department? The Treasury Department. Alexander Hamilton's department. The Treasury Department. So the, the Treasury Department under Lincoln would the, beat the British Empire, for which the British Empire in turn assassinated him. And that wasn't the first assassination that's been done. Alexander Hamilton was assassinated for the same kind of reasons. And uh, I remember these things. I wasn't always there, but I could whiff it coming, something like that coming in my direction. So anyway, so this is, this is where we stand. All right. So now we, we, have, we, need a, we need something else. Okay, we are go we're going to go back and create a, a, a currency like a greenback which means that the uh, Treasury Department of the United States, under the United States Executive Branch, will create an, an act which authorizes, cancels all these other kinds of banking system, and says that any the Fed, Federal Treasury Department will issue an order under which banks which, are, which qualify for banking under federal law will be not only entitled, we will not use that as a vehicle for credit system for our people, for employment, and things of that sort, but it will also be a means for increasing the productive powers of labor. And that we will create jobs, but we have to have high technology jobs. We're not going to have green jobs, because green jobs are downward. They actually de destroy the economy. If you want the economy to grow, You've got to get non-green jobs, which are productive jobs, higher technology jobs. You upgrade people, as Franklin Roosevelt did in the 1930s. He took people off the streets, made sure they were paid, as not, not under Obama, made sure they were paid. They got some employment. They got benefits where they needed, emergency benefits. We pulled, them, we pulled the people of the United States off the streets. We put them back to work. They weren't working much, doing much, any good, but we wanted them back to work as a matter of principle. We did it. We increased it. We made turn these emergency employment programs into programs which actually began to build up the economy. By the time we went into the war, we created one of the greatest machines of economy and warfare the world had ever known. And it was done out of the conditions of despair in 1932-33. And we can do that again with, by Franklin Roosevelt's measures, but we have to understand what the mechanisms are, which very few people ever understood. They never understood the, the mechanisms of our constitutional system. You have all these idiots running around in the Congress saying they know what our constitutional law is. They don't know what our constitutional law is, because the constitutional law is not a, a, a bunch of ifs and ands and so forth. Our constitutional law is a systemic, scientifically defined systemic system in which we pay no dependency on money as such. Money as such is worthless to us. The only money that we honor is when we have foreign trade, in which case we have to deal, make a special provision for foreign trade in order to accommodate foreign trade with the United States. So therefore, we have the, we have the uh, Hamilton position is exactly that. And if we go back to Hamilton, which very few people in the United States understand, I, don't, I doubt that there's a living president who has, a former president, who's still alive today, who understands how, what, the, what the principle of the U.S. Constitution is. I think I can prove that, and this article, which I've just produced, this 33rd page, will show you exactly why probably mean no president of the United States in recent terms, no, probably except Jack Kennedy, knows what the meaning of the, of the U U.S. Constitution is on this question, on the question of the credit system. Money has no intrinsic value. 
That's the constitutional principle of the United States. Money has no intrinsic value. Money is supposed to be something that increments to higher and higher levels of productivity. That, and Hamilton laid it all out. There are these four letters of his, these four statements of him. It's all there. And also the question on the, on the question of banking. Same thing. We, get, we accommodate foreign powers who don't fit within our exact economic system. We accommodate them as a matter of, of association, for a mutual, mutual advantage. But we don't, it, money has no intrinsic value. The presumption is that the increase of productivity will come naturally as a result of the employment and the raising of the technology. This applied to agriculture, it applied to manufacturers, and other things. Money has no intrinsic value. And no system does it have intrinsic value. To give it, attribute to it to have intrinsic value is simply a presumption with no factual scientific basis for it. It's the increase of the productive powers of labor. Now, look at this, what do we mean by that? Mankind is not a monkey. Many members of Congress are, I think. Certainly most Wall Street people are certainly monkeys because they don't earn anything, they don't produce anything, they make nasty smears all over the place, make terrible sounds, all the, and they stink. Oh, they stink. So, so the, the productivity is, is a result of the in, of human increase in the the leveling of the human mind to higher and higher degrees of power in society, the increase of the productive powers of labor. The principle used to ring through the struggle of the United States: the productive, the increase of the productive powers of labor. That is the Hamiltonian principle. What do we do now? We go to a green policy. What's the principle of a green policy? The green policy is less productive than the pre-green policy. In other words, we, we make production more costly and with less benefit. That's the green policy. Isn't that insanity? Fracking, for example, isn't that insanity? No. And so they, these are the kinds of considerations which we have to deal with. And I have today, right here, boom, right here, the complete formula for what the policy of the United States should be in terms of economy. It's the right policy, it's based on Hamilton, which is the constitutional policy of the United States. And all we have to do is stick to it. We don't need, we need innovation, scientific innovation, other kinds of innovation. We need those things. We need to do things we never did before. But in principle, the idea is there's a progression where mankind is getting better and better and better in the capability of dealing with the challenges before us. And that's where we are. Everything else is crap. Well, let me premise my next question um, by citing a short passage from your new paper. This paper is called uh, Build the Real American Party the prospect for a U.S. future, Democrats in the next election. And it is now publicly available. Um, but I think this passage really lays out the parameters of the next question that I'm going to ask. So I'd like to just read it. You say, um, the result of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy created a condition under which there has been no actually net growth of the per capita standards of production and living since the assassination of President John Kennedy through to the present time. The growth, the growth of Wall Street and related nominal income wealth has not actually been productive, but rather essentially parasitical. The collapse of the productive standard of living in the USA in physical productive terms per capita and per unit of energy flux density since the cancellation of Glass-Steagall 
has been the greatest rate of accelerating collapse of the per capita welfare of the net physical product of the United States in our history, not counting the parasites of Wall Street and comparable mere parasites. Now, earlier this week, uh, LaRouche Pack issued a leaflet titled, The Cable Has Been Cut. British Empire's bail-in is driving thermonuclear World War III. And this leaflet featured a updated version of Mr. LaRouche's heuristic triple curve collapse function, which I'm going to display on the screen here, which shows the transition from the hyperinflationary bailout policy of uncontrolled uh, money printing, as you see there, to the implosion policy of so-called bail-in, which Mr. LaRouche has likened to an elevator in free fall from the 70th floor after its cable has been cut. And as you can see on this diagram, starting right there, after the Kennedy assassination, the net rate of growth of the United States economy has been consistently negative. While hundreds of trillions of dollars in worthless financial assets have been accumulated by Wall Street, uh, with a rapid explosion of this worthless money following what we've come to call the Graham Leach Bliley Lewinsky Act, and Monica Lewinsky certainly was caught in the act. Um, but after the repeal of Glass-Steagall in 1999, which came out of the setup and the virtual coup that was run against Bill Clinton. So let me now display the next graphic. Uh, in this graphic, you see this process of hyperinflation taking off in 1999 uh, with the at that point, estimated total financial aggregates worldwide uh, at a level of around $275 trillion. That's a lot of money in 1999, but surging to $1.7 quadrillion by 2013. That's a sextupling in the span of only 14 years. And sextupling might have something to do with Monica Lewinsky as well. But what happens in 2013? You can see that when the bailout policy begins, uh, all of that fake value, $1.5 quadrillion dollars, begins to go up in smoke, just disappear into thin air. Now, over this past week, uh, there's been a new resistance to this British bailout, bail-in policy that has surfaced, ironically, from inside Great Britain itself. Um, Mr. Liam Halligan, who had written a column just over a year ago, right after Cyprus, denouncing the bail-in policy uh, as what he called undermining the very financial and legal fabric of our system itself. And he's consistently been, been on record calling for Glass-Steagall. Liam Halligan wrote a column uh, this week in The Telegraph in which he warns that massive losses continue to smolder on European bank balance sheets. And he quotes a City of London fund manager who says, and I think this is an apt comparison, QE is like putting a blanket over a dead body. It keeps the flies away but it doesn't solve the problem. And now we're just using bigger and bigger blankets. Um, and Liam Halligan concludes his article by citing Lord Lawson, who's a member of the Parliamentary Banking Commission, who called last week for a more radical approach, a full Glass-Steagall separation. And Halligan says, Lord Lawson's remarks carry enormous political weight and are likely to reopen the UK's debate about the need to impose a Glass-Steagall split. Now, uh, I want to come back to what you've been discussing uh, earlier this evening, Lynn, with the three-part approach premised on Glass-Steagall but not limited to it. Number one, shutting down Wall Street by restoring Glass-Steagall and wiping out all this fictitious debt that we saw. Two, returning to Lincoln's national banking model in which all banks 
are accountable and subservient to the federal U.S. Treasury system. And then three, an FDR-style credit issuance for large-scale projects, such as NAWAPA, related measures driven by a crash program for thermonuclear fusion. Um, and if you think about it, it's clear that these three steps combined, taken as a unity, are the only solution to the collapse, the triple curve collapse process that you saw demonstrated here. Now, in your latest paper, uh, which we cited, Build the Real American Party, you make the point that you made this evening that Wall Street's very existence is a fraud uh, according to the true standards of net physical productivity. And you identify this as the Hamilton principle. Um, now, you say Hamilton's principle is to be recognized as the kernel of our federal constitution, the perfectly unifying principle of eternal human progress. And this idea of a unifying principle, which you come back to repeatedly, you say was elaborated in these four reports, especially the opinion on the constitutionality of a national bank. And you say, in that report, Hamilton achieved a relatively highest point of insight into the nature of the human species, which you say is the essential wholeness of that species, a wholeness which is in and of itself the principle which regulates the process as a whole, the noetic principle of the human mind. So I found, found that quite provocative. And this, um, this understanding of the Hamiltonian principle as a principle of unity, uh, I just wanted to ask you to elaborate more on that. Well, the problem is, forget money. Just forget the idea of money as such. Money is simply an instrument, which a negotiating process. But it has no money has no intrinsic value. The difference is this: is the nature of the human species, and the problem with all of these Wall Street and similar types of fakers, and I do say fakers advisedly, is that they don't understand the difference between mankind and a beast. The, the difference is mankind voluntarily increases its species power. That's what mankind does. And if it doesn't do that, it's a failure. So the, the point is the history shows in, in every way that one thing, man, what's the difference between mankind and a monkey? The monkey cooks his own food at a fire. I mean, the man commits his own fire. Hmm? Monkeys don't. Animals don't. Now, human beings use fire. Now, what does fire mean? It means a conversion of the increase of the energy flux density of the process. So you go to higher and higher forms of temperature application. And that's how you do it. Now, this results in the pr general principle of chemistry, uh, that mankind goes to higher and higher orders of chemistry. Now, this takes place in form of such a thing. The idiots don't understand this. That is a typical idiot to the accountants, and they are idiots. They don't understand what, anything about this. What happens is the ability to raise the temperature of production to higher levels is the upward evolution of mankind's powers. The history of mankind is the increase of higher and higher orders of power, intensity of power. Hmm? That is creativity. But that is done by whom? It's done by mankind. No monkey can cook its own food. Only mankind can do it. So mankind's acquisition of knowledge of how to raise the temperature of production, in effect, which comes into engineering, the uh, use of uh, radiation, reflecting radiation, all kinds of things which are done to raise the relative energy flux density of the process. And what mankind's program is and, and meaning is, is the increase of the energy flux density of mankind 
and enter into any units you might imagine. And therefore, we are now going on what? We are now going beyond, the, beyond anything ever, anybody anticipated to be the periodic table. We're out beyond the periodic table as such, up to higher orders of en energy flux density. We are about to move out into nearby smaller space, not to live there, but to make our arms reach effectively out there, to grab satellites out there, control them, use them, harvest them, and to find ourselves to enable to create more power to control the processes within the solar system itself, all being done essentially by mankind on Earth. The use of helium-3 as a as stimulus for the higher energy flux density uh, of, high, of high, very high proce uh, processes. This is another case. Mankind has the ability to reach out beyond space, not to live there, because our, we, our conditions of life as a human species is, are vulnerable, but we can reach out by artificial means and exert actions on nearby solar space. We can improve the neighborhood of nearby solar space. And we can do it by remote control. We can create on Earth and on the moons. We can create the uh, moon as such. We can create the instruments. We can begin to understand what mankind is. Because we, we, when we lose this dependency on the idea of sense perception as such and realize that we can create, well, let's take one case of this, exemplary case. You had a gentleman who was the first to discover the solar system. Well, he came from a, a succession of scientists you know, who made these discoveries, and he, Kepler, discovered the solar system. Nobody else had ever discovered the solar system. Only Johannes Kepler had ever discovered the solar system. All competent science, all competent European science depends and has depended since the work of people, you know, the greatest scientists, who, who understood this. And so mankind has, has a noetic power ability to create abilities, intellectual abilities, to create higher energy flux densities controlled by mankind, to control the destiny of mankind. And the, there is no limit to what mankind can achieve. There may be specific limits to specific kinds of things, but the idea of progress as, as a human characteristic is something inherent in the human species and always has been. And therefore, even when mankind cannot live on Mars or cannot live in nearby space, mankind can control processes in living space, in nearby space. And we are at the point where we no longer are dependent upon green policies. We're no longer dependent upon these mythologies that we were dependent upon before. We don't, we're no longer limited to sense perception. We have discovered means by which we can indirect, indirectly control the effects we used to attribute to sense perception. We can measure things we never could measure before. We are capable of functioning beyond the range of any notion of human sense perception. And what the idiots want to do is take that away from us. But everything I've said right now is true. It's a generality in a large degree, but it's true. And there is no limit to what mankind can accomplish. We don't know what the limits might be, but we cannot believe that there is any limit. Because if we look at the history of mankind, mankind has come from a creature which is barely able to cook his own food. But no other living creature ever could do that except mankind. We've seen the history of, of chemistry. We see how mankind 
chemistry is, is a human creation. It is not something out there which is so-called naturally independent. It's a human creation. We voluntarily raise the energy flux density. And the, what we're doing with chemistry is exactly that. That's why the mathematicians are such idiots. They're not chemists. Huh? You have all these jerks out there who call themselves scientists. They're not scientists. What are they doing? They're working with calculating machines. They say calculating machine will never give you chemistry. But they're doing it. They're idiots. They're fools. And the point is we have to realize what the human species is and what the human mind is. We are not limited to sense perception. That's one of the great fallacies, the idea that the human mind is limited to sense perception. No, whatever effects we can create by will are products of the human mind, not of sense perception. And that could go on and on for that for a long time. But that, in brief, sums up the whole matter. All those poor fellows out there don't know what they're missing. I would hope they would come to understand that. Okay, well, Lynn, we will ask you to elaborate a bit more on what you just opened up. Um, <laughs> Now, as you know, a number of us have been involved in discussions over the last weeks and months with some leading scientists in the field of fusion, mm -hmm. the next platform of increased energy flux density. Now, the problem we run into is that these are not bad people. They're committed to science. They've given their lives to the idea of advancing science, of making discoveries, or at least attempting to make discoveries, making breakthroughs in the fields of fusion and other areas but they seem to be lacking the appropriate method. Typically, the method comes down to taking a number of measurements, codifying those measurements into some sort of mathematics, putting it into a computer, seeing what the computer spits out as a, as a um, forecast of what will happen. Then they run the test. And the test, the physical test, doesn't cohere with what the mathematics said or what the computer spit out, so they refine their measurements and they do the process again. And they just keep doing that over and over and over, seemingly spinning their wheels, not making the breakthroughs that are necessary. Now this seems to be in direct contrast to what you've been discussing with uh, what you've called the two triads. The Brunelleschi, Cusa, Kepler triad, and then the yet unfinished business of the triad of Planck, Einstein, and Vernadsky. Where if you just look at Planck, for example, his discovery of the quantum did not come about through deduction. He introduced a new hypothesis to resolve a problem about a new type of action, a quantum of action. Or Einstein, his discovery of relativity did not come out of a deduction. He first asked the question, what would the universe look like if I was riding on the front of the wave of light? Right, he started with a a very seemingly abstract question. So there seems to be a very different quality of method involved when you look at the likes of a Planck or an Einstein versus what we see occurring today in the field of science, despite what might be very well-intentioned minds. So for those who would like to see a discovery made, who would like to achieve a breakthrough towards this next higher platform, what do you say should be the proper method of investigation? Well, first of all, you have to drop the whole investigation and to say, wait a minute, uh, this seems to be a blind alley. What's wrong? Well, I can tell you what's wrong because I know, you know, psychologically, you know, from my own experience, which I actually in before adolescence, but in adolescence in particular, it became very clear to me what this whole business was. What I saw was a social phenomenon. The social phenomenon which I saw was the classroom. Huh? And I realized that the members of the classroom were essentially all behaving like idiots. Huh? Because what they were doing, they were given an assignment to 
answer the question in the mind of the teacher or whoever was giving this, administering this examination. And they would get a grade based on what, how well they fit the predetermined presumption of the classroom or the teacher or whatever else. And I learned in the course of this and experience, at least by the time I was 12 or 13 years of age, I recognized that, that Euclidean geometry was a great fraud. The whole thing was a fake from beginning to end. And yet I was sitting amid, amidst all these classrooms in which various kinds of geometry, you know, various kinds of geom levels of geometry so were being taught. And I would sit there in disgust. And I found this kind of experience, the experience I saw with the classroom generally. The students were actually being brainwashed. And that's not an unfair characterization because they wanted to get a satisfactory grade. They would stereotype themselves to say, they, I'm going to get an A, and they'd find they would get an A. They would get a B minus, a C, a D, an E, or an F. And they, they would rate themselves, the teacher would rate the students and the institutions entirely on the basis of these assumptions. But the point was, as I discovered, that I could make discoveries. And I made discoveries which told me that this was nonsense, that the, 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 te the test was a fraud. Now, the exemplification, which solidified that for me perfectly, personally, I was only a teenager, barely a teenager at that point, was this case of Euclid. When I was sure that Euclid was bullshit and that other things I thought were bullshit were bullshit, I was free. I was no longer worried about the grade. They flunked me, I flunked them. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> because they, that, and the problem is you think about it, if you reflect, I mean, I, today, of course, the student is in a much worse condition that, than I was at my time. Uh, much in, today, the, there's almost, the, the student has no ch fair chance at all. And there's no intention to give the, you, the student a fair chance. There's no intention. What's taught in the classrooms today is criminal. The teaching profession today is becoming absolutely criminal, destroying the mentality. No wonder the young kids are on drugs with the kind of schools they're going to and the programs they have. Because we have, with the green policy, has been a synonym for the destruction of the minds of our young people. Why are they on drugs? Because of that because of the classroom process, because they, are not, they have no self-assured sense of personal identity. It doesn't mean anything. For them, there is no such thing as truth. It's what you like to lick or don't. And that's what it amounts to. Now, if we change the subject a bit, and said, well, all right, let's make a requirement that no teacher can grade a student on that basis. The teacher is going to say, to a lot smaller classroom, actually, because you can't handle all that. You, you, can't, you go over 15 students or even 12 students, you're, you're going to have a problem in, in really conducting, a, a, say, a class which is, say, 40 minutes in duration. You can do very little in that period of time. So you, you, the teacher is smart, will actually, well-intentioned and understanding, will say, OK, I'm going to, this is my objective. This is my, my objective as the teacher to stimulate the student to come up with something. It's my responsibility as a teacher to now think about what that student did in response to this stimulus and look for the geniuses. A great school looked for geniuses, not based on learning what the teachers had told them, but of trying to stimulate in the student, see which student could make a discovery which was beyond what the teacher had prescribed. 
So you don't, want to, you don't want to teach backwards. You don't want to teach the application of the predetermined, predigested idea. You want to stimulate the student to make a discovery. And if the student fails, that's all right. That's not a problem. The point is, don't prejudge the student's mind. Take, analyze what the student has done. And then ask the student to explain what, what does he think he's done or she's done. That's the way to educate. The idea of this predetermined standard of get the, supplying the right answers to the right questions is a destructive process. Now, you had, what happened is you had a, a change from Franklin Roosevelt. The minute that Franklin Roosevelt left office, the United States was in deep kimchi because Truman came in and the Dulles brothers came in. Evil fellows, indeed. And the FBI got bad. So therefore, what happened is you had, you had a, an, a, an idea of tyranny, a British influence upon the U United States educational system, which had the effect of tyranny to standardize what the student is supposed to be taught to believe. And the implication of the whipping fee doesn't say the right answer, the approved answer. So the, the point is, you don't want to dictate to children. Yes, you want to you know, control the situation, but you want to control the situation so the student's mind can function, the child's mind can function. You want the child to suggest to you what the child thinks. And you find that you know, mothers and parents, generally, will, will look at that. If they're, if they're intelligent, they're going to want to encourage the student to do some thinking. And you have to appreciate at what levels of age group that they can do these things. But you want to push to, toward the top to find out what level they can achieve and stimulate them to try to see if they can do that. And that's how all the creative minds worked. All the great discoverers in science worked that way. Go to the top the best you can do. And it's better that you should fail than that you should swallow some predigested kinds of nonsense. So you want to stimulate people to think. You want them to think for themselves. Not in some wild way, but you want to challenge them. What do you think the answer is to this? What's your opinion about what this is? And try to evoke a serious response from the student. And you'll find out how, as I've seen you know, in my own experience, you often find that some of these children, who you think were children, can act, be very intelligent. You know, what you know is you recognize they saw the answer before the question came. That was the bright student. The student always had anticipated the answer before the question was delivered. Because the very setting of the classroom created that so that the student who was, was see what this is going, where this is going toward. Hey, wait a minute, I see where this is going. Hey, I understand it now. And that's what the difference is. I have the advantage. Uh, you know, of being an independent enough, and so forth, all these other kinds of things. So I was, I did everything on my own. Not everything, but in general, it was my own idea. Learn something. Don't learn to be taught. Discover. Discover, and find out why, when it doesn't work and when it does, and, and learn from those experiments. What the whole story is about. That was a very beautiful answer. Uh, we're going to bring a conclusion to the webcast tonight. Before I end, I want to just announce that there will be a joint town hall meeting occurring simultaneously in Texas and California tomorrow, being hosted by Keisha Rogers, who is a candidate for U.S. Senate in Texas, and Michael Steger, who is a candidate for U.S. Congress in California. Um, this is going to be broadcast live 
over the Keisha Rogers website, which is KeishaRogers.com, and viewers can participate, uh, tune in to that website to participate live. So that's a conclusion to our broadcast tonight. Thanks a lot, Cody, for joining us, and thank you very much, Lynn. Good evening. Good night.